Hello everyone, welcome to Archant Towers on a festive Friday, I'm calling it, I'd like that one. Um, myself and Paddy are here, we've been to uh, Colney this lunchtime, and we are of course uh, here now to run through what was discussed, uh, some of the high points and what have you. We got to speak to Daniel Farker and Mario Vrancic, uh, if you want to get involved then leave your comments and questions on the Facebook page on Pinken and uh, I'll go through those and we can uh, hopefully get stuck into those as, as well. Um, but Paddy, good evening. Evening, Mike. It is evening, isn't it? Uh, Colney today, there was some. Um, well, you, you led it really, certainly with Daniel, yeah. and um, there was a lot to cover, as much in terms of looking ahead to January. And you know, we had the news today about Christoph Zimmerman, and then of course, Raggett and Ben Godfrey. They were the kind of yeah. three interesting points. We'd love to get into the Leeds game um, yeah. earlier uh, in a bit too. But um, uh, interesting with those guys, what they're sort of figuring out, how they're going to do it, and. They're clearly in no rush to make decisions. No, no, no. I mean, it's going to be on Norwich's terms. All of those aforementioned, and obviously Zimmerman, have decided that now is a good time to, to extend his contract. Um, yeah, I, I guess every every January it feels like this. <laughs> As you go into it, there's a lot of lot of chatter and a lot of speculation, rumour, and normally not much tangibly happens, and it'll probably be the same again, because we're going into a window where, again, reiterated recently at the AGM from Stuart Webber, that, you know, financial parameters they're working to, uh, they're not, it's not, you know, it's not going to be a very busy window at all, and if there was anything inward, then that would probably be only as a result of anything outward, and uh, they're under no pressure financially, certainly this window, to, to need to do that, so... Um, in that context, yeah, but but having said that, we're kind of talking about players who are already on the payroll and what their short-term future might hold. Um, and in both Raggett's and Godfrey's cases, uh, and throw in Alex Tete as well, who's obviously out of contract, and there's been an increasing amount of discussion about where he's he's going to be beyond mm. the end of this season. All the, all of those cases, it's very much okay. Yep, we know that January's around the corner was a message from Daniel, but there's a lot of football and a lot of points to be won, particularly uh, given. The, that they've managed to get that that one off on on the board against Sheffield Wednesday, and so I think really very much the focus at the minute is Leeds tomorrow. Then you roll into Brentford, roll into the festive period, and, and that's almost as much as we're there talking to Daniel Farker. That's almost really for Stuart Webber. That's his remit. That's the, how the structure works now. It's for, for him to put the groundwork in, and then yes, at some point in January, a final decision has to be made on Raggett, Godfrey, and you know, at some point, clearly Alex Tete. So. Yeah, plenty of groundwork going on, but nothing firm made on any of those cases at the minute. Just um, before we get stuck into the game ahead, on what Alex Tetty, uh, what Daniel said in terms of Alex Tetty, and you, you can see a lot of, uh, well, pretty much all of what Daniel Farker said on these subjects, it's all on the Pinken uh, YouTube channel, and you can, of course, find that on uh, pinken.com as well. The videos are there embedded in Paddy's stories. Uh, what did you mean, What did you get the sense with Alex Tetty in terms yeah. of, I mean, because I've always kind of felt that's probably it. Come, yeah, yeah because, just because I can't see them renewing his contract. No, no, no. I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd be in, in agreement. <laughs> Wrote a column on it midweek, I think. Again, a lot of this will be dictated by how the rest of the season pans out, which isn't great if you're in Alex Tetty's situation or his advisor because you clearly want some clarity. And the reality is because he's out of contract in the summer, by, by January they will be able to speak to interested parties. Um, and I'm sure they the player and his representative want a clear signal from Norwich but if Norwich aren't quite sure where they're going to go in terms of the next few months um, we all know the financial implications of not going up again this season in terms of the running out of the parachute money and that's going to make mean some major decisions are going to have to be made in all areas of the business particularly the, the first team squad Alex Tetty is He's not getting any younger, is he? And, and and we're talking about Godfrey, and it's quite pertinent because there, there's a guy who's playing in the same position as Alex Tete. Um, whole career ahead of him. Pure potential at the minute. Alex Tete is the other end of the scale. The financial dimension, I'm, I'm pretty sure, without sort of giving any numbers away, that Ben Godfrey will be on a fraction of what Alex Tete is on. These are all factors that have to flow into a decision with Alex. Again, same with Johnny House and same with, with Jacob Murphy. We've had it again from Daniel in recent days. Would he... In an ideal world, wanted to lose good players, no. But the financial reality was such that they had to do that. And and I think ultimately, if you've got a replacement in Ben Godfrey, who's who's clearly now, with each passion game that he plays on loan at Shrewsbury, he's, he's developing. Um, yeah, I don't see it. I, I think if they were 
if they were keen on doing something, then they'd probably be a long way down the road. So, yeah, OK, I understand what Daniel said on that particular topic, which was basically uh, Alex has been out for eight weeks. You know, let him get back in, let him prove his fitness, let him get in the side, then they can sit down and talk. Um, but I think the reality is, you know, everything you, you would feel about this situation would lead you to uh, think it'll be, uh, thanks for all your service, we move on. Ben Godfrey's the future, Alex Tetty, sadly, is probably the past. Um, uh, indeed and there was a, a nice little line of thought from Daniel Farkas saying that we, we, we kind of want players who are up, going up the hill rather than, rather than down. down it yeah, I think yeah. that's right isn't it yeah. um, Terry Wright says bring Godfrey back and play him so Terry wants um, Ben back in, in January we will of course see uh, and S- Sam Cornell's been in touch huge game tomorrow in my mind must work hard uh, Leeds United of course Ellen Road uh, a game where as Daniel himself said, you probably take a point at those kind of venues. It doesn't mean you're not going to go and try and get three, but yeah. ultimately if you came away with a, a point, and you kind of emphasised in your question to Daniel just how sticky their Leeds run has, has been in, in autumn. Yeah. They've just kind of picked it up now, though, haven't they? Worrying Leaf and Norwich. Yeah, <laughs> good, good win at QPR uh, last weekend. Yeah, I mean, you can see the parallels. Maybe not like for like in terms of results, but in terms of good periods and bad periods. I mean, at the start of the season, there was a lot... A lot of pundits already thought they were a Premier League nailed on, you know, almost where Wolves are now because they had such a good start. And and you always feel with, with that club, if they can get that rolling, you know, with that support base and everything that comes with it, and obviously an owner who's quite ambitious, it would appear, um, that they would take some stopping. But, yeah, remarkably, you know, prior to this three games unbeaten, they were eight games, one wins, seven defeats, you know, that. That in it, it, in many respects is the kind of problems Norwich have gone through. You know, no real consistency. Um, yeah, I mean, I not purely because it's their first return to Yorkshire since they went to Sheffield and Bramall Lane and and, and faced down quite an intimidating atmosphere on and off the pitch. Um, I, I just feel it's it's another one of those performances required tomorrow. If they're as resolute as they were without the ball at Leeds, you feel now with Pritchard, Madison, Oliveira with with better service. They'll create chances. They'll score goals. It is for me tomorrow hinges on can they repel? Because inevitably you go to Welland Road. There's going to be periods of the game we saw it. Different set of players I know in the main, different management. But last season, you're freeing them up. You're cruising. How can they ever lose this game? And they were hanging on at the end because once that crowd are up, that's a very difficult place. So there will be tough moments within 90 minutes tomorrow. But if they could be resolute defensively, I think they've got enough going forward to get some. Which I guess kind of. Um is the point in terms of who Daniel Farkas selects and we do know that Alex Tetty is going to travel with the squad whether he plays is a, is a different matter but he's certainly going to be um, with the group yeah. uh, doesn't sound like there's going to be many cha- he doesn't really want to change the group up much no. does he and, and everyone else I think is, is still recovering so the guys like Jamal Lewis and James Husband they, they won't be in uh, they haven't travelled and, and they won't feature yeah. so does that mean he's going to change? I, I get the impression that he's probably not going to change the eleven much. Maybe Josh from Mali, possibly, and that might be it. Yeah, spot on. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I think reading between the lines, he was well. Why wouldn't you be? Second half, they were very good against Sheffield Wednesday. You know, with the ball, without the ball, um, and as we keep saying, they're striving for a consistency in results. Well, you look back to that two-month period. That came from a consistency in selection, and and ultimately. For Daniel Farker, if you put 11 on the pitch and they all collectively and individually perform and you get results off the back of it, why would you change it? Because they're going out and doing it. I thought it was interesting. We spoke to obviously Mario after mm. afterwards and uh, I think you made the point, you know, because you've now got far more options across midfield areas, the lads who do get a shirt tomorrow, they know that, that you know if their levels dip, they'll be out the side now. It isn't a case of like it was a few weeks back. You look around, there's, there's very few bodies to come in and change it around. That isn't the case now, particularly in midfield areas. So... Yeah, a little bit of internal competition, I think, is more than healthy. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Mario, because we're going to talk about that um, now. I'll just mention Mark Vivian is confident on a, comfort- a comfortable 1-0 win. Comfortable 1-0 win? Comfortable 1-0 win. Okay. Goodness me, let's hope so. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought up Mario, because we did get to have a chat with him, and uh, he was very honest about his own performances. Very good. And, and very good. just in terms of the fact that he, he was uh, not happy, and he expected more of himself. And, and the bits that he improved were, were the basics, he called it. The, the bits that maybe a, we, we, we constantly talk about in the championship, winning a few headers, winning yeah. his challenges, not taking so long on the ball, yeah. just little things like that. And he's not quite there yet, I think, no. but he's certainly improved. Oh, he's definitely, yeah, he's definitely offering more now than, than he, he was. But you probably can't 
underestimate. I mean, he talked about the uh, adaptation period, and for some players, particularly coming from from a, you know, a different league, a different country. In fact, it will take longer. Tom Tribal slotted in as if he'd been playing in a championship for you know many years. Zimmerman, okay, he's had his, his moments, but he, he's managed to grasp it as well. Maybe because of the type of player Vrancic is, and you're dropping him into a championship, which every other week is a different type of opponent and different type of stress you know particularly in, in the midfield areas you know it, it can more often than not be a very much about rolling up your sleeves and, and fighting and winning duels you know I looked at him today actually physically you know there's not a lot of him and so you know he has to be very good as a technician because I, I don't think he's uh, he's going to be smashing players out of the way in the middle of the park but yeah I liked I like the honesty and and the self-awareness that he mm. knows he, he knows he's, he's not delivered he knows there's questions against him still um but I thought an interesting point was because, and he has been, the last couple of games, he's dropped him into a deeper role. He's always been in the two in front of the back four. Um, and he says in that number six role, as he called it, you get a little bit more time on the ball. It's not as frenetic as, you know, one one higher, in, you know, in sort of where Madison is and um, Watkins, Pritchard, those sort of areas of the pitch. And, and yeah, I can see that because there's no doubt on the ball, he's, he's a very, very decent operator and he can pick a pass. And we've seen that sporadically. So... If you could find a position for him in the pitch and get the right balance around him in midfield, then there's no doubt for me he could influence games at this level. But we need to see far more of it. But yeah, it, it was quite refreshing to hear that today. You know, there wasn't any hiding behind excuses. You know, he he knows he hasn't been good enough. He understands why the fans feel he hasn't been good enough, and he's trying to do something about it. More credit to the lad. Yeah, spot on indeed. Uh, Mark Newstead bench for Josh Murphy tomorrow. We kind of touched on that, don't we? Just expecting that? Yeah, I got again following on from what we just said earlier. I think Marley Watkins got his chance second half and grabbed it and 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 basically said to Daniel Fucker, "Look, keep me in this side." So. Yeah, I'll be very surprised if it, if they re- reverse those two tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Chaplin agrees with Josh, the Josh uh, sentiment, but also Yannick Vils should, should start tomorrow. A lot of people have, have said to me in the last couple of weeks they've sort of been a bit disappointed we haven't seen more of Yannick. And of course you mentioned Sheffield United. That was the place he went and, yeah. and scored the winning goal, the only goal. But again, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, you, how would you accommodate a midfield of Watkins and Wiltshire Bearing in mind Pritchard and Madison are shoe, shoe ins, and you need two to build the play either Reed, Tribal, Tete, Rancic. Um, again, difficult decisions, but good decisions, I think, for Daniel Farker rather than, you know, who are we going to put on the pitch today? So that's where he's got his earn his corn now. He has to get that mix. There's no more excuses in the sense that he's got this debilitating injury uh, crisis across his midfield areas, particularly. You know, he now has plenty of options, plenty of variety. Can he find the right mix? Lovely job. Uh, Mark Vivian also mentions about the uh, Madison Pritchard combo. He says it will destroy most teams this season if kept fit. And you had, you had a story, didn't you, with, with Daniel Farco and just some of his quotes on ready to un- unleash and unleash yeah. the two of them together. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's got that. I mean, c- because you, you would fear are they too similar? You know, are they going to inhabit the same areas of the pitch? Are they going to want to try and get on the ball and do the same type of things? But it's a little bit of a cliche, but I wouldn't disagree. You know, good good players are able to adapt and and play off each other, and I think those two give them time, and I think they could they could strike up a very good understanding. But with that caveat, you know, when Norwich lose the ball high high up the pitch, and and you know a back four is vulnerable, then the rest of the midfield has to be right because if it's not, then you know we can, the worst moments of this season have been when the midfield balance hasn't really been right. You know, Millwall springs to mind. Um, so yeah, for me. This phase now is all about Farker getting it right more often than not in terms of his team selection. Um, and if they do that, I'm not overly fearful of going to Leeds. Yes, difficult place. Yes, intimidating place. But you think Leeds, Brentford at home, Birmingham, Burton away, Millwall at home. That is a run of games that they should be taking a half-decent haul of points. And then if they did, you turn for home into into the 2018 in, in a healthy position, maybe top 10, looking upwards rather than over your shoulder. Yeah, there are definitely chinks of light, I think, in how Norwich can go about it tomorrow, just from listening to how Leeds do it, and they're, they're quite keen on an attacking sides so and maybe a little bit vulnerable at the, at the back. I'm not saying that's any, any different to Norwich at times, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I think that there are definitely opportunities there. A couple of general questions, should we touch on these? Uh, one from JB and Messi Guest. Thanks, uh, John, for getting in touch. What is the future of the goalkeeping position if we get promoted can we keep Angus Gunn? If not, uh, we're looking for another option in January or the summer. I mean, I can't see one coming in January just by the amount of goalkeepers 
they've got and it's worth pointing out on the Pinkin show on Wednesday Scott Howie was very good on um, on how he sees Angus at the moment and, and what he's doing well or not but uh, yeah uh, Remy Matthews uh, uh, is sort of the one ringing in the back of my yeah. head to a degree for next season yeah I wouldn't disagree yeah I think um, yeah if they, if they weren't to go up I think as much as Angus has got an attachment to this place um, on on a personal level from the lad and also from Man City's perspective they'd probably be looking to move on and maybe try and get a Premier League loan because I think as it stands looking at the guy they've got in there now he's only a young man himself um, you don't see him getting dislodged anytime soon so if Man City still want to retain Angus's services then I, I don't know with another season in the Championship probably suffice maybe not so um, yeah I, I can't I can't see a scenario where next season Angus Gunn is in goal for Norwich if Norwich are in the Championship so if that is the case um, you know McGovern I think they'd probably like to move him on I think he falls into that category with the Jarvises and Naismiths of this world again with the financial un- uh, underpinning of that decision and uh, that would then leave Remy Matthews who every time he goes out on loan you know the club he's at basically love him he's, the fans love him uh, he can't do any wrong so he's clearly got something about him we've yeah. not really seen it in a Norwich shirt but um yeah, they extended his contract, so they clearly feel that he's one for the future. Yeah, why wouldn't you give him a go next season? Yeah, spot on. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, ben Woodward, besides Tetty, I, I should also say uh, David Brett. We've already discussed Alex Tetty. If you go back to the video when we finished, uh, you'll be able to see what we said about Alex Tetty uh, and his contract. But, uh, but Ben asks, besides Tetty, who else is out of contract in the summer? Um, Tribal, he mentioned he was only signed on a one-year con- contract. But there's an option there, there's an option there. Yeah, yeah so that's not too much of a worry. I, th- I think Wes Houlihan is one of the big high-profile ones. Harry Toffolo is another. Yep. But, yep. Um, I guess uh, what happens with Wes will be an interesting one. He's not getting a... L- well, I said that, he started against Cardiff, so he, he is in and around it. Yeah. Um, it's not like he's completely out of it. No. But, um, yeah, again, there's, w- with any of these... Tete, Wes Hooland, there's many moving parts in that. It's not just what the club wants or what the club wants to do or what the club can do financially. You know, it's also from the players' perspective. And if you're Wes Hooland, you know, I would think they say don't they play as long as you can and if and if he if it if it comes to a, reaches a point where he's very, very sporadically used, yes, we know how deep the attachment is between him and the football club, but at his age, he probably wants to be playing football, doesn't he? So, um, you know, that that would be an interesting dynamic, yeah. So there's so so many imponderables at the minute because we're only literally, I mean, we're literally at the halfway point of the season, I think, after Birmingham Boxing Day. Um, until until we really, you know, get to the point of, well, we know Norwich can't do this, this and this in terms of aims and objectives for the season. It's very difficult to plan with any com- complete certainty, you know, because there's so many different scenarios still because, you know, as bad as they've been on this run, you know, it's still, it's still everything's down for them, really. Uh, you know, if they got on a decent run, so yeah, it's a little bit too soon to say anything definitively, whether it's a Godfrey, whether it's a Raggett, Tete, or Wes for that matter. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's an inch. I mean, obviously, the, the thing with Wes is this is the testimonial aspect of it, isn't it? I mean, that would be ten years at the end of this season. Yeah. But he is out of contract, so. You know, do you give him a, do you give him another year or so, and then off the back of that, you have a testimonial game or? very difficult it is very difficult and we'll see how it all plays out uh, Joe McKenzie I think with Tetty in on Saturday and Norwich won't lose so there we go we'll have to see how that one goes as well uh, Adam Harvey and, and uh, John both asking basically how crucial the next few five games are to where season, Norwich's season yeah. goes from here because as you said after Leeds especially there's a run of four games where you'd have liked to think that they could rack up a few points and at least get themselves a, yep. uh, a bit higher up the table in reality. Yeah, I think it's pivotal. Again, just left left it there on the previous point. If they come through this five-game stretch and there's not that many points between them and, and the top six, then, you know, of course, everything's still down. But, you know, where are they now? 14th, 15th, you know, listing, basically. If they sort of stumble through a few of these next five games and, and they're still where they are now in the table, then you know I'm afraid you can forget about anything in terms of uh, uh, top end promotional sort of ambitions, and it'll be about consolidation first and foremost this season, um, and then maybe accelerating those development plans. And that, as I say, might flow into a get Godfrey back here, play him for the rest of this season, and then you know kick on again next season. 
just before we wrap up, uh, Mark's asking about uh, Stephen Naismith, about what his future is. Not sure, but he's not going to be travelling this weekend, so um, we're, I'm sure we'll be able to get to speak to that one maybe before the Brentford game. Um, and just one more, Mark Neust is asking about Carlton Morris. He's still a little worried about the striking positions, um, but Carlton will come back in January just for a little look, I guess, and then he'll go back at, at Shrewsbury, yeah. won't he? I don't think he'll be hanging around. I think in an ideal ideal world, and again, Farker reiterated it today, that both him and Godfrey have gone to Shrewsbury because they want them to play a full season, regular week in, week out football, um, and that's the only way they're going to move on in terms of their, their development. You know, It's no good for either of them to be back here and then maybe making a bench for the odd game, maybe getting on for 10 minutes, you know. Look at Ben Godfrey, he's he's obviously kicked on in a big way. I know Morris hasn't been in the side, I don't think it's Shrewsbury the last few games, but he was scoring a few goals. Um, yeah, I, I think in an idea, well, they keep them to at Shrewsbury, basically. Good stuff. Uh, right, well, we will uh, wrap this up now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your messages. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be back uh, here live to send off the coaches in the morning, aren't we, Pad? That's the plan. Depends how late you stay out on the Christmas party, mate. Oh, I could blow my cover. But we'll see how we get. We'll see how we get on. It could be a reason to tune in in the morning. I think it could be around half eight, quarter past eight, uh, in the morning. And then we'll, of course, uh, myself, Paddy, and Dave Freeze will be uh, heading over to Elland Road. Uh, hopefully, there won't be any snow on the roads. Uh, do you want to save the prediction for the morning? Yeah, why not? Let's do that. All right, that will keep you uh, coming back, won't it? Uh, Thanks all. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, We'll see you in the morning and have a lovely evening. Until then, bye-bye.